Welcome to The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis. I am your host, Cicely Davis. My name is Cicely Davis, and I welcome you to the inaugural episode of The Savage Truth. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm female, I'm black, and I love America. I was born in Rochester, New York, and my childhood was the stereotypical poor black experience. I wasn't raised in a Democrat per se household. My parents weren't political. In fact, politics wasn't discussed at all, with the exception that my dad made it very clear that he hated Ronald Reagan and thought he was an avid racist. Like so many other Blacks in America, my household was defined as single parent. My mother and father never married. They struggled in and out of a tumultuous, high-stressed, rocky relationship with my father repeating bouts of in the household and out of the household until out of the household became his permanent status the summer before I began the fifth grade. But I'm not unique to this experience. And in that experience, you will find the genesis of social engineering that destroys Black families, father absence. Now, you may be picking up on my tone as I describe a little of my childhood about my beginning and my parents' relationship. You might be thinking that I'm a bit too casual or too blasé, ebonically speaking. This is because my story, my beginning, unfortunately, is like so many other Blacks in this country. And where it is never my intention to shun or shame my parents, I honor them and love them deeply. It is, unfortunately, a story that runs very typical in Black culture and in Black communities. There will be plenty of opportunity to share my story and my background with you as we explore American culture and headlines of local and national news in web streams and in social media. But I came from a typical no questions asked Democrat liberal household and believed all the lies, all the misconceptions and all the ideologies that came along with it. This, of course, is defined and described as the black monolith. But before we get too deep into this, let me tell you something that completely changed the trajectory of my life, something so emotionally charged that it drove me with all my heart and soul on a completely unique life path. I will sum it up with one word, veterans. Veterans began my political metamorphosis. While I was completing my bachelor's degree, I volunteered and ended up taking a job working in a local veterans hospital. And I saw something I hadn't seen before. In this experience, I met some of the best people I ever had the chance or the privilege of meeting. I was humbled and in awe of their service to our country. And I heard stories from men and women who served in combat and some who didn't. Some who had lost limbs and others who had suffered from trauma. And they would say things like, I was just a cook or I was just a truck driver. Some saw combat and many did not. And I met some of our last surviving World War II veterans. And I saw how these men and women loved America, how they were proud of the service, their service to our country. But I saw something else also. I saw how they were treated. I saw how they were neglected during the Obama administration. And I was outraged. I saw an injustice that led me to tears at night, and it was this experience that led me to take a deep dive and look into a president who could allow this to happen. This person was supposed to be my president, a president I once voted for, a Democratic president who turned his back on our veterans, and this changed my life. This wasn't my president at all. In fact, 
I would say his two-term presidency was the cancer of our current collective society. Because you see, while he may have wanted to change America, he didn't actually love America. And while Black America was busy loving Obama, he did little to nothing to help Black Americans. And that is a savage truth. I got angry and I looked at myself and I got involved. I realized the Democratic Party didn't have the same ideological views that I had and that I wasn't voting my values. And I realized to the horror of my family and a lot of my friends that I was a Republican, a strongly conservative, flag-waving, proud-to-be-Black in America Republican. I wholeheartedly embraced the Republican Party. And then I became the state director for Blacks at Minnesota. I began to volunteer extensively and I became the chair for my Senate district. And I did all I could for the Minnesota GOP, as well as volunteered for local and conservative Republican candidates. In fact, I am a former Republican endorsed congressional candidate myself. For those of you who don't know, I ran against Ilhan Omar in Minnesota's fifth congressional district. And for those of you who aren't sure who Ilhan Omar is, she is the Somali squad member, a Democrat congresswoman from Minnesota who hates America. And yes, I unfortunately lost to her. So where do I go from here and why a podcast? These are significant questions and ones that I had to ask myself. After I lost my election, I had time to reflect on my loss and what it meant to my future. And even though I had lost, I hadn't or didn't feel like I had lost because I had gained so much. I gained knowledge and friends and an even deeper love for this country. I reflected on something my husband told our children. He said, just because you're right doesn't mean you'll win. Too often today, we have an expectation of outcome. So I thought about that, and I asked myself if I was willing to fight on. And I was, and today, I still am. But why? This wasn't a simple answer, and I had already faced criticism from Democrats and from Republicans, from my family members, and various people from my own race. You're a race hater you're too conservative, or you're not conservative enough. You're a Democrat plant. You're a sellout. So why am I doing this? Because I feel like I was called to do this. Because I don't answer to criticism. I answer to God and to my faith. My faith is rooted in God and in country. And that faith is unwavering. I am proud to be a Black woman in America but I am an American first. So now, who are you? I think this is a question that we need to all ask ourselves. Who are you as an American citizen today? Where do you stand? What are your beliefs? Because it's easy to point fingers at our neighbors or click like on Facebook or hearts on Twitter, but who are you when nobody is watching? How do you conduct your own personal behavior? Do you represent a good citizen? And are you worthy of the sacrifices that have been made for your freedom? Imagine for a minute that George Washington has traveled to the future. He has only 20 minutes to stay in 2023, and you've been chosen to have a private dinner with him at Mount Vernon. You walk in and he's sitting there at 6'1", in his uniform, and he invites you to sit down. Candles are flickering on the table and he looks at you in the eye and he says, or he asks, so tell me what you've done with the freedom we've given you. What do you say? So maybe by fixing America, we first begin by fixing ourselves. So rather than beating ourselves up, let's all agree that each one of us can be better today than yesterday. 
and that by doing so, we begin a path towards improvement. Suppose today you did a random act of kindness for a stranger. Further suppose that after doing such an act, you didn't post to Facebook or Twitter or any other type of social messaging. Let's go off on a tangent and say, for example, you're walking down the street and you hand a stranger $20 and walk away before they can acknowledge it. Without that expectation of outcome, does it feel the same? Suppose the only acknowledgement you receive is your own. Is it worth it to you? The reality is, as human beings, we are rarely motivated to do anything without getting something in return. That something may be as little as acknowledgement or as great as fame. We will typically calculate the expected outcome while we weigh it against the effort or expense. So what about our founding fathers? George Washington was a wealthy Virginia farmer when he took command of the Continental Army. And what did he risk? He risked his life and the life of his wife. George Washington, had he lost the war, would have been charged with high treason, punishable by death. But not just any death. It would have been one that included him being tied to a horse and dragged to the gallows, then hung and cut down as he neared death. He would have been eviscerated, his intestines burned before him, before having his head chopped off. His body would then have been quartered. And in death, his wealth would have been confiscated, leaving his remaining family destitute. His wife, Martha, faced being burned at the stake if she were found to have been a co-conspirator. The founding fathers all faced similar fates. Fifty-six men signed the Declaration of Independence, knowing full well the outcome of failure. Imagine the courage it took to strike pen to paper. Imagine the debt we owe these great men, and imagine above it all the courage and bravery of one man, George Washington, the father of our country. So the challenge is to move forward every day without a guarantee of outcome. Just because you're right doesn't mean you'll win is a savage truth. So, my fellow Americans, I pose to you another question. Where did the strength of George Washington come from? Could you have done that? Risked your life, your spouse's life, family, reputation, your future, without a guarantee of outcome? Could you have signed that paper? We take for granted today the sacrifice and bravery of these men and all they risk so that we could be haughty and rude and ungrateful. But I digress. I would argue that George Washington's strength came from his belief in a higher power, something greater than oneself. Of course, a higher power greater than oneself would be a hard sell today in this me culture. But Let's go there anyway. I'm just saying that George Washington doesn't strike me as a man that would have been taking selfies as he crossed the Delaware. So when you stop serving yourself and serve others, you can truly receive the reward of service. In serving others, George Washington saw a reflection of character in a being greater than himself for a purpose greater than himself. George Washington was extremely private about his religious views, but what we know is reflected in his actions. During the Revolutionary War, he ensured that there were chaplains of various denominations to meet the spiritual needs of his soldiers. He also encouraged them to stop swearing and gambling because he told them that it would be difficult to ask for God's favor on their efforts if they were constantly insulting him by their behavior. And at the end of the war, he encouraged Americans to thank God for the opportunity to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. And I think the word opportunity is key, as in God provides the opportunity, not the guarantee of outcome. That's on us. 
Furthermore, as president, his first ever executive order was to establish the last Thursday of November to be declared a day of thanksgiving and prayer, marking the end of a brutal revolutionary war. In his Thanksgiving proclamation, he wrote, The duty of all nations is to acknowledge, obey, and be grateful to Almighty God. That same God is a great and glorious being and the author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. So what can we learn from this? I would say that this country has moved further from our divine creator, and we've moved further from our purpose. Today, we are a divided nation, and it seems we've lost our moral compass. And what is this moral compass, and how do we get it back? For me, I like to start here. So let's take a look at the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. If we as American citizens follow these rules, what is the projected outcome? Or suppose you don't identify as a religious being. Okay, let's just say you follow four through 10. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Does your community get better or worse? Or if you can't follow a religious doctrine, let's just focus on being a good citizen. Let's try this on for size. Some characteristics of a good citizen. Trustworthiness and honesty. Courtesy. Respect for the rights of others. Personal responsibility. Accountability. Self-reliance. Respect for the law and patriotism. Again, I realize this puts great pressure on us as individuals, but let's just imagine a utopia where people actually hold themselves to an accountable standard. And then what if we hold those that govern us to an accountable standard? What if, like George Washington, we held ourselves to a higher character? Unfortunately, that's not the path we're on as Americans, and we squander the opportunity afforded us by a higher power. Today, 64% of Americans identify as being Christian. 50 years ago, that number was 90%, and that is a savage truth. But don't fear, don't fear. In this podcast, I will not be preaching to you or preaching at you, but I will challenge you to identify where you fall and or fit in this fabric of American societal culture and how you do or do not contribute to its current state. So this podcast will take a look at culture, American culture as defined today, and pick it apart. I will make fun of the ridiculous. I will call out those who attempt to make sense out of nonsense. I will tell the savage truth and dare to discuss topics that have been deemed taboo, call out those who drain society of decency, integrity, and honor. I will tell the truth about Black culture and undoubtedly ruffle some feathers. I will tell the truth about roles of men and women and our current society and rail against feminism as it is defined today. I will talk about the obvious double standards of cultural appropriation as led and defined by the left and the complacency of the Republican Party as it pertains to elections. I will discuss sports, parenting, music, sex, drugs, rock and roll, politics, history, social media, and the press, and how all these and more have rendered the most free, exceptional, sovereign nation ever erected to something that our founding fathers worked so hard to prevent. And I'm going to ask questions, questions like, 
When are Black Americans going to wake up and return to the Republican Party? When are we going to accept that father absence is and remains the number one contributor to crime, our rank in education, death, and incarceration? Wasn't Victoria's Secret better when the models were all female, tall, thin, and really good looking? Do you remember when the restroom was never a question, when women didn't have five o'clock shadows and men didn't attempt to breastfeed? If a Caucasian woman wears cornrows and is accused of cultural appropriation, doesn't that same standard apply when drag queens wear bras, makeup, and dresses? By the definition, wouldn't this be considered female appropriation? When did it become okay or acceptable for the church to display political flags? Is there anyone else out there like me that just wants basketball players to do layups, blocks, free throws, dunks, and shoot two and three point shots and not tout their political agenda? Can we go back to the days when the end zone of an NFL game read Vikings and Ravens and Patriots and Rams, not end racism? Why is Black History Month, Women's Month, Asian Pacific and Indigenous people etc. month necessary? And if it is necessary, where's men's month and white history month? Why am I considered a weak woman because I believe in leaving and cleaving and submission to my husband? I could go on and on and I'm sure you can too. These are the questions we all have thought about or pondered, but perhaps only spoke about in private or safe spaces, but need someone to say them out loud. I will be that person. I will say what we're all thinking. I will tell the truth about these absurd new cultural norms and discuss what we must do to get back to sanity. Believe me, you are not alone in these notions, thoughts, or ideas. And I'm going to challenge each and every one of us to hold ourselves to that accountable standard. Let's decide who we are and how we can best reflect the ideals of our founding fathers as led by George Washington and others. The simple fact is this. Human rights come from God, not government, not political leaders or political entities, but God. If a party is willing to dismantle the very country that empowered them to lead in pursuits of a one-party state, That's not democracy. It's fascism. America is the greatest, most free and exceptional nation to ever exist and must remain as such. And America owes no one an apology. Let me say that again. America owes no one an apology. We owe a debt to those who founded it who risked their lives and who gave selflessly so that we can live free and without tyranny. So let's get back to repaying that debt by resurrecting the ideal American standard. Through this podcast, our aim will be to attack this current counter-American culture by expressing the disgust and outrage of those who wish to erase family, faith, country, and service. So buckle up. Here we go. Be beautiful, be faithful, be American, and above all, be true. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. I am Cicely Davis. This is The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next time. The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis is a production of Front Page Magazine and the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.